Okay, so the referendum did, didn't pass. Now we have to move forward. Um, do you think there should be another referendum? Are parts of the school improvement plan that we put forward last time, what parts of the, do you think there were uh, good parts in there? Uh, what's the best way do you, do you think you can communicate with voters about what they want? We'll start with you, Marina. You all that? Well, I hope so. Let me know if I okay. did. <laughs> um, so yes, there are parts of the referendum like I talked about. Um, we need bathrooms that are accessible to students. We need um, roofs fixed and <coughs> windows yeah. not leaking. And the school budget is only as good as what it is on paper. You never know when something's <coughs> going to go wrong with a pool or if we need a new bus. I mean, it's, it's not a black and white issue. Um, <coughs> Well, we do have a survey going out now, and it's due back on the 25th, and I hope everyone got that and is responding. We have an outside agency that's gathering all this information, and the referendum is not cheap, whether it goes through or not. Having the survey go and someone tally all the votes and bring that back to us, that is still not cheap. I am a big tight one, and my husband will tell you, my kids will tell you, um, so I really hate spending money in this way, but we need to have the community tell us what the needs are. We need the students to tell us, and we as a board need to listen. So it's not up to me whether I want this referendum or I don't. I need to listen to what you guys are saying and what the building needs and what the students need and what the staff needs so they can all do their job. Um, so after this survey comes in, we will meet again. We will gather information. I think there will be another survey that goes out in September or October. And it's all gonna be a learning process for us, but we need to listen to you guys. It's not just up to us. You need to be the voice that tells us what direction you want us to would go in. Would you be in favor of another, another referendum question? Um, I would be in favor of another referendum if it's the things that we really need and not really want, and it doesn't have a huge tax burden on people in our area. I do not believe that I can say that I am for or against any referendum at this point in time because I have no idea what it would look like. So until the survey comes in, until we've heard from everybody and what people want, and also administratively and with our teachers and with our students, um, I, I, I can't say whether we will or whether we won't. And so once those that information comes to us and once we sit down and we go through it again, then we'll evaluate the information and go forward from there. Um, we're not talking about any decision making until next year at this time, um, so it's a, it's a, it'll be a long process. It was a long process before. Like I said, it was we evaluated it over a year, so I don't see this being a, a, any type of a quick fix at this time. But um, I know that there are needs for certain. Thank you. Uh, well, I I sure hope there's another referendum. I mean, it would be. It would be a, why would we have a referendum for $36.8 billion for all of these things and then turn around and say we actually don't need them? I mean, there must be needs in there that, that need to be met. I'm not on the school board, so I don't know the ins and the outs and the nitty gritty. Um, I just saw sort of the high level. In fact, I had a difficult time getting, getting drilled down information uh, about what was in that budget for the, um, for the referendum last year. So yes, I think that that's what we need to be working on. And I, I think that we need to, uh, like you do, and you know, I'm a, I'm a small business person here in town, and if I have a need, I don't just go out and like pile stuff on. I figure out, well, how much can I afford? And when what is this gonna do for our community, or in, in my case, for, for my business and for my employees? Um, and I go from there, and then I work within a budget. And I think that that is probably makes the most sense is to start by looking at well, what what will the budget be, and then let's let's start with priorities. Um, personally, I it seems like some of the expansion uh, projects were really important. Um, the the elementary school expansion seems to be an obvious place to start. Those children need to make sure that we need to make sure that the teachers have the space and the time for the children. Oh, I'm probably not gonna be able to talk a whole lot about this, but um, I guess just in general, yes, I think that, that we need to do that process. And, and I have ideas about uh, ways we can get more of the community involved, both 
within the school and without and outside of the school. And again, I'll just reiterate, I think it's really important to talk to the students and that didn't happen this last time. Um, so I think that that's, that has to be a priority and other young people in the community, not just the students that are there. Okay, Angie, we'll start with you. Um, what inspired you to run for the school board? What schools do you think you bring to the board? Skills. Skills, sorry. <laughs> if, and if you've already served on the board, what are you most proud of? If you're a new candidate, what do you think, what would you like to accomplish if you get on the board? Can I say that one more time? Read the whole thing? Yeah, it's what, a long one. <laughs> what inspired you to run for the board? What skills do you think you bring to the board? And if you have already served, what are you most proud of? If you're a new candidate, what do you think, you, what would you like to accomplish if you get on the board? <laughs> we got two minutes. <laughs> so, um, what am I most proud of? I am most proud of seeing the students walk across the graduation. Um, it's, it's such a pleasure. It brings tears to your eyes when they walk across and you see how happy they are and the gymnasium is filled with people and you, you hear about the achievements and the awards and the honors and um, there's just such a, a feeling of happiness and success. So that's my most proud moment. Um, second most proud moment would be the preschool children as they come on that first day and they are so honest and some are a little teary and some are really happy and you see the parents excited for them starting their um, educational process. And then what am I most proud of? What, what, well, what skills do you bring? To what skills? Uh, budget, balancing the budget. Um, I worked with a $79 million budget referendum through Western Technical College, $2.8 um, million budget at the Boca Raton Foundation, $11 million budget at the Boca Raton Schools. As well, I run my own business, so I have that budget as well. Um, and then policy and procedure. I have rewritten with the board all of the policies and procedures for the Boca Raton School District for Western Technical College. I legislate on the state and federal level as well as on the local level. Um, so I bring all of those talents as well as being a business owner myself. Uh, raised, two, raised two sons. Um, what was the other part? Um, Accomplishments. Yeah, I think you covered it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> See? You went on your time. You're next. Oh, okay. Um, my motivation for getting on the school board is really to ask questions. I feel like there's questions that are not being asked and I'm hearing them out in the community. So my idea is to be able to bring some of those questions into the school board at the table and have them have that conversation be wider. That's my main motivation. I also think that there's real utility after, uh, we, we have quite a number of private schools and homeschoolers in the community and I think that those voices need to be brought into the school district and there needs to be more integration. So um, I guess that would be one of my goals, but that is my motivation, just to increase the uh, level of education and the diversity of education for, for the students inside and outside of the public schools up there. Um, the skills I bring, uh, I'm a small business person, so I get to talk with all kinds of people and um, I'm good at being in a group of people and listening and integrating their their ideas, and then I think one of my one of my skills is um, looking for solutions, uh, kind of reflecting back at them. Well, what if we tried this? How would that work? Or um, could we ask this other person? Or who who else should we bring in to help answer some of these questions we have? So I think that I'm I'm very good at that. Uh, I also think another skill that I bring is that I I really enjoy having conversations even with people that I that don't necessarily agree with me and I, I feel like I learn a lot from those conversations and um, and hopefully I, I bring something to that too uh, what do I want to accomplish I want 80% of the children that go to school every day maybe 90% to want to be there to feel inspired to feel like their time is worth it to feel like they're getting back from their community, and I want the teachers and the rest of the staff to feel as valued as, as I know that they are. So 
well, what inspired me to want to do this? A lot of people say that a lot of times, why do you want to do this? And I don't really have one answer. I think um, I've always had the nonprofit heart. I work for Cooley Cap, now I work for a community health center. And why wouldn't you want to be in a position that you could help form the life of a young person and their education path and be a role model for them? So I don't know if that is really what inspired me, but that is what brought me down this path, and I do love it. Um, the skills that I have, um, I am a health advocate, and I do advocate for um, all kinds of health care for badger care for kids, um, people that aren't, maybe don't have employer coverage. So um, I think that is a skill that I have that if I see something and I believe in it, I will advocate for it. If I, if I don't really agree with it, I will listen to you and I will tell you my opinion and maybe you can change my mind. But you know, I'm pretty open-minded and I want to hear everything and I think that's a good skill for being on the school board. Um, something that I'm proud of, um, just being a representative of the school board. Um, I can be at Walmart, I can be picking up kids from dance class, and I, you get questions all the time. So I think that's proud, I'm very proud of that, that people put their trust in me and they ask me questions, and I honestly do not always know the questions, but I know the people that I can text Keel and he'll get the answer and I will say, Keel said this, and I will not take credit for their knowledge, but I am the person that I know a person that knows a person and I will get you the answer that you need. Um, and something that I am proud that we've accomplished as a board, um, we're a very good team, we work together, and like Angie said, when you see those kids that are struggling through their freshman year or sophomore year, and when you can shake their hand when they're walking across the stage and tell them that you made it, and they did it all on their own, you know, the, help, the school helps, but those kids have to do it on their own, that's a huge accomplishment. Back to Alicia. First, um, here's one from the audience. Uh, how can the school board improve dialogue and communication with the community? Yeah, thanks. That's a that's a great question, and um, I guess I have tried. And uh, uh, if if I can serve on the school board, I will make this a high priority. I would actually like to have uh, more public forums uh, around issues that in, involve our young people. For example, sports and safety, or school safety is a big issue that we're not talking about. Um, we wanna put $7.3 million to it, but we're not gonna have a conversation about it first. Um, I've talked with Spears, I've talked with mental health, Sheriff Spears, mental health folks, and students and teachers, and it seems like the first step is let's start having a conversation and see what we want to happen in our schools. Uh, we could talk about addiction, we could talk about mental health issues, um, we can talk about screens and devices and how that's affecting our children. We can talk about arts and music and, and what that brings. There's so many issues that I think are, are right for us to get together as a community, not just the people that are involved in the school, but um, the, the larger community as well can benefit from these conversations. and perhaps feel themselves more a part of the school district and find more ways to participate with the school district. We used to have a situation where schools and school districts were an important part of the community center where parents were very involved in the schools. And I feel like we need to work back towards that with the school district or the school board hosting more community forums and inviting the public more frequently, maybe every quarter, maybe even a little bit more frequently to um, talk about the issues that are so important, not just to our young people, but to everyone in our community. And I think that that's a, uh, that's a, that's a start. So I'd, I'd start with that. Can you repeat the question? Um, how can the school board improve dialogue and communication with the community? Um, well, we have many forms of communication. Um, we do have the school website. We have Skyward, we have um, pieces of articles of information in the newspaper, we can be on the radio more often, um, the school, the community has a TV station. Um, all the board members' phone numbers are listed on our website and none of us are ever off duty. We're always approachable with a text or a phone call. Um, and of course you can always come to a school board meeting. There's public comment at every school board meeting. Um, and I think the school itself works really well with the community. Our doors are usually open to members that want to come in there. Um, and then within the school, um, 
The teachers have good communication with IEPs for each individual student. So I don't really think that there is a breakdown. I think it's as good as you want it to be. If you want to check your email and your website or whatever form that works best for you, we want to work with you to get that information. The school board never wants to hide or hold back any information. Um, but you know, everyone has their own ways. I hate phone calls, I love texts. You know, I never thought I would be that person. So everyone has their own way that they want to be approached or have knowledge and get their information from. And I think the school board, uh, the, all the staff at the school, they want to get the information to you about your child or about um, snow days or whatever it is, changing the calendars. Um, we, we just want to do it in the way that suits you best. And I think there are plenty of revenues already out there that we can utilize. So we have advanced our website this year. It's actually gone through a tremendous overhaul, very different than it was um, last year. So that's one goal that was very important to the school board at this time. And so we did that. If you go to it, all of the information about what's going on at the school is on our website. And then we also started something this year called Actigy. And you can download an app and you get uh, clicks on what's going on and updates. And that's something else that we just started this year that the uh, board wanted that type of initiative to make sure that there was more information available to community members. We're also well aware that not everyone has technology. And so um, we have the ability as a community to reach out to our superintendent or our school board members at any time. I get many calls and I am always happy to receive them. And anyone can have any item placed on a school board agenda at any time. It just has to follow policy. So any topic can be discussed anytime you would like it to be discussed. Um, you just have to add it to the agenda. So we already have that format. Um, as far as having um, forums like this, we cannot have, um, we have to follow the law. And so there are open meeting laws. And so you can't discuss a topic that is not on an agenda without um, posting the agenda and without the specific topics being on the agenda. And so we would be happy at any time if there's an, a, a topic that somebody wants to speak to, we can schedule a meeting and that's all that someone has to do is request it. So if someone wishes to do that, please do. Thank you. Okay, um, I have a question here. Somebody submitted a question that's kind of similar, but um, some people say that the passage of Act 10 worked just as Governor Walker proposed. It gave school districts a way to keep costs down, keep property taxes in check. Others say that the cost of those changes were too high. Do you agree with the passage of Act 10? Do you think it was a good thing for Viroka schools? Would you like to see it reversed? Who am I starting? I, think you said I started last time. Oh, I get this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know, um, Act 10 is the budget repair bill that was set out by um, our former Governor Walker. Um, and I do think that rural area schools handled it as well as we could. Um, we, we created a committee with um, a few school board members, a few staff members, and some admin. And we kind of looked at the school handbook and we wrote a few things. So I think the teachers that um, you know the teachers that were affected do feel that they were treated fairly. Um, I think that they were given a good benefit package and compensation. It wasn't ideal. Act 10 did give us um, a little more. How do I want to say this? Um, a little more ways to be creative with our staffing. Um, there were some staff that maybe were protected by a union and. Every school knows that there are their high teachers and there's the teachers that aren't doing so well that maybe are on a path to improvement or have a mentor, which is great, but we do want the best teachers in front of our classes. And um, so Act 10 gave us a little leeway and we did lose some teachers and we did have some teachers that run a different path. It gave us a little more room as a board to work with the teachers, work within a budget. Um, so I think the way that Viroqua Schools handled Act 10, um, like I said, I think we treated everyone very fairly. Am I missing any part of that question? Um, do you think the cost was too high? Those changes? Was um, there any downside to that? I do not. I think um, what we were able to do with our staff and their compensation and benefits, 
Um, I can't say it was too high. I'm thinking that it was it was fair. That's all I can say about it. And with the new governor coming in, I mean that is what it is. But we need to look forward. Um, so my, probably my answer is no. I don't think it was too high. So in following Act 10, I believe that what happened was that there were things that were that took place behind closed doors. So the process of Act 10, I do not believe, was transparent. And when you're working with any government body, for example, the school board or any government body, we need to be transparent. Everything needs to be posted. You follow the open meeting laws. Uh, you have people at your meetings. You have discussion at your meetings. And uh, you can have public comment. And they didn't follow that process as transparently as I would have liked. Um, as far as the advantages of Act 10, we now have skinny classes in high school. So we have some students that um, having the 90 minute block is too long for them and it's only for a semester. And so they learn more effectively when they can take a class all year. So we couldn't have those skinny blocks before Act 10. So one of the advantages for our district is we were able to implement that. We had a little bit of flexibility. We respect our teachers in Florida. We want our teachers to be happy. Our benefit package is good for our teachers. It's one way that we actually draw teachers into our school district. Um, as far as a, a, a negative, um, like I said, I think that the process was terrible and left a really bad taste in, in people's mouths. But because of the respect that we have our, for our teachers, we treat our teachers fairly and we get feedback and we still meet with our teachers and we're trying to increase the salaries for our teachers and be fair so that we're competitive with other districts and also mainly just because we respect the work that they do and um, they're our backbone. So we thank them. No, that's okay, thanks. Um, uh, I, I have a, I will say I'm a little bit biased. Both of my parents who are here were um, public school teachers for 30 years. And I think that a lot of the reason why we ended up in Wisconsin at all was because of the amazing uh, educational system that we had in Wisconsin. Um, and so, and I will say the other thing is I don't have a lot of experience with Baroque schools pre-Act 10. I have experience post-Act 10. And, um, and I was at the Capitol numerous days with my father, who's back there, who was on uh, the, the um, teacher's union in his school when he was a high school math teacher. And uh, I listened to the teachers, and the teachers were extremely unhappy. And to me, that tells me that uh, it was a really bad deal for teachers. And if it was a bad deal for teachers, it was a bad deal for our children. Uh, it, I guess in, in my experience, I also run for assembly a couple of times, so I've had an opportunity to talk with different school districts and, and meet with teachers specifically. I get a different story than, um, than I hear when I talk to the district administrator, when I talk directly to the teachers, they talk about having a difficult time filling math positions, science positions. I know that we've lost um, a lot of the arts because of this. Uh, I, I just feel like we've lost that, that basic value where we know, everybody knows that the public education system is one of our, our uh, most important gifts that we, that we give to our children and to our community. And I, and I feel like Act 10, is responsible for that. Okay, maybe we start with Angie again. Um, Baroka has a lot of choices for education, public schools, private schools, charter schools, homeschooling. There are even several charter schools within the district. Um, do you think those choices are good for taxpayers or we should we direct more resources to less choices? I believe that having choices is a wonderful thing. Our community has so many choices, and I don't believe that it's my responsibility to dictate what another family chooses as um, important for educating their child. That's, that's not my job. Um, I think it's our, our community has evolved into this 
wonderful place because of choice. So I, I think this is good. Uh, well, yeah, my kids, you know, they went to, we, we came here because of Waldorf, and now my daughter is in the charter school at Laurel. Um, we interact with a lot of, um, my other daughter will probably end up at the Youth Initiative High School. We interact with a lot of kids through soccer and um, through, I guess, other activities, but a lot through soccer that are homeschooled, that go to the Christian schools, and um, I think it's probably one of the most amazing things about our community is that we have this, uh, we, we mix it up a lot, we learn from each other. And actually I think that that's one of the strengths that I bring to the school board um, is, is that perspective. And, and I'm hoping that that will continue to be a trend that I can get on the school board and, and then bring some of those, the valuable things about the other ways people look at education including homeschooling, and what can we do for the homeschool community? I mean, I think this is an important question. What needs are, is, are not being met that perhaps the district can help meet? What, how can we share resources like also with other school districts, um, like the DeSoto Trap Team that we're, we're just beginning a, a relationship with? How can we find ways to, to make the resources that the district has work for more of us? And, um, and at the same time, bring that diversity uh, and that richness into the school district and help us as a school district and as, as the public schools uh, learn um, some, of the, some of the amazing things that the rest of the community has to offer. So for a town the size of Viroqua, I think our school choice is amazing. Um, I don't think that all kids learn in the same way or at the same pace. So for us to be able to offer all these different options for students is amazing. We have Better Futures, which is a school that has four goals, and the main goal is to help these kids that are really struggling, and their goal is to graduate, because that is the job of the board. We want every child to get an education. When we are here to educate all the children, whether you're falling behind or whether you're the top achieving. Um, and as a school board, we get to see a lot of the kids that are the student of the month or the Rotary um, student. But my heart is really with the kids that maybe had to drop out of football because they are getting an F or that are just at school because they need breakfast and lunch. And those kids are in our system. Um, a lot of people don't live in that world and don't see it, but um, they're there. And we need to make sure that we can reach every one of these kids and educate them in the way that they need to learn. Um, when the Montessori school first came to Viroqua, I was not on board with it. I knew we had Pleasant Ridge, and I know we have a great elementary school, and we have Cornerstone, and I had to be, you know, I had to be brought into it, and now I can see that the Montessori school is awesome. Um, there were some, you know, difficulties with them getting integrated into our elementary school, but it worked, and it's a great thing with a waiting list. Um, so people need to change, and the kids are changing. They don't, they don't learn the way that we did in a you know, single classroom with a wall. It's more of an open education way now. Um, and I also love to see that the high school kids can come over to the elementary school and be a mentor to them, and the fourth graders can have lunch with the first graders and help them open their milk. I mean, all of us being integrated together and working with the kids in the way that they need to be educated is what we're here for. With you again, I think, Lisha. Um, if you had friends that were moving here with children, they were evaluating local schools, and they asked you what you thought of the local school options, including the Roka School District, what would you tell them? That we got it going on, man. And I have actually, I have had friends that have moved from various places um, for the school system. All, all parts of it, the public school system, the Montessori, and Waldorf, um, not, not the Cornerstone, not Christian Cornerstone as much, but also. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I, again, kind of like Marina just said, you know, we, it's, we have an amazing amount of educational opportunities for kids. So the one, for a small town like this, and so the wonderful thing is uh, uh, a lot of families that are coming here with small children can look around, and I know plenty of families and their, their kids are in different schools and um, that, that serve the needs of their child. And how many small rural communities can say that? I mean, it's, it's 
it's just amazing. Uh, and I do give credit to the school board for, for part of that, you know, certainly the charter schools that are happening and um, even the, just the, the regular old public school I've always felt is, a, is an amazing public school for a rural area and uh, it, feels, it feels close and intimate and it feels like a great community and so I'm, I guess I, I'm answering the question, but I, I feel very excited about being involved in that and um, even even mixing it up more and, and, and making it uh, even more rich. And I actually think that it's a, it's a selling point for people to come here, which is why I think it's very important that we have reasonable property taxes as well. Get into that in a second. Okay. <laughs> oh, I think we're here. Oh, me? Yeah. Sorry. So I've also had friends that have asked about the schools and they have moved here. Um, I usually tell them to, you know, try to meet the teachers at, at your grade level or go in and have a conversation with the principal. Um, go to the local coffee shop and just get a feel for the other parents. Um, we're a small community, but yet we're not that small. So um, always be open and talk to people. I think mostly it comes down to the parent. You are the first educator for this child and you know what's going to be a good fit for your child more than anyone. And it's got to be someone that you feel comfortable with. So if you get into a classroom and you are not comfortable with that teacher, you need to talk to the building principal and make sure that you know you can make a change or you can figure out what's going on because you have to be responsible for what your child is getting every day from eight to three and you have to make sure that your child is comfortable with the teacher that they're with. Um, so it really does come down to the parent and the parent doing the homework to make sure that their child is at the best school with the best fit. So I'm involved in some interviewing processes and bringing some people into our community and taking those families with young children to uh, tours around Europa. And I can't share enough with everyone that's listening today how impressed people are with the options that we have in our district with all of them and what a difficult choice it is for them. And um, I know many people as well that have sent their children outside of our school district as well as to every single different school option that we offer here. So it, it's wonderful that we have those options and they're all good. They're all loving and kind and caring and considerate. They all have high expectations. They just do things a little bit differently. I always say that's why they make chocolate and vanilla. It's just a little bit different and everybody likes a little different flavor. So, um, we have somebody that's going to be coming actually next week that we're going to be showing around our area that wants to move here. And I'm excited to show them all that we offer. And we, we co-op, we co-op with DeSoto, uh, we have a gymnastics co-op and a golf co-op, and now we have a trap shooting co-op and a hockey co-op. And so we offer a lot of options in that way. And we have virtual schools. We have students who are homeschooled that do take courses at Baroqua and that's a nice thing that we're able to offer and so I feel that those options um, we have built a library in our community that many people now um, that homeschool are able to meet and work together and those children build relationships and then they end up taking a course or, an, uh, or two in our high school so it, it's wonderful we just live in an amazing place thank you okay so Alicia was great to marry in your first uh, we'll do one more question, and we've got to get time for closing statements. So two minutes for closing statements. Um, I was trying to come up with a question, kind of get at um, what school districts or any local unit of government, there's always a balance between how much you spend and what you're getting for those dollars. So I'm trying to come up with a way of asking about that, see if you can follow me. <laughs> uh, Baropa's tax levy has kind of gone down a little bit in the last couple of years and then come back up. And the mill rate is actually down. Um, uh, Baroque was actually in the lower third in, as compared to area districts in terms of mill rate. Do um, you think those numbers are too high, too low, just about right? Do you think Baroque ta taxpayers are getting a good value for their money? Well, I definitely think Grove was getting a good value for their money because we have an awesome school and an awesome community. But then again, like I said before, I am a cheapskate and I think taxes are always too high. 
Our mill rate right now is 8.89, um, and I think we're pretty much on target. Um, the other school districts, West Salem, Sparta, and Black River Falls, they are pretty much the same mill rate that we are, and that's what I was, would expect because there are school districts that are our size. Um, so yeah, I think that we are probably where we should be as far as our mill rate. It's a complex question. So I believe that school districts are underfunded. I believe that we should receive more funding from the state and also on the federal level. Actually, there's some news out today that uh, Governor Evers is wanting to increase um, the amount of funding for students who have special needs from to 30%. And if they don't do anything, it's going to go to below 20, 25% of what the cost is to educate students who have special needs. Um, and then next year, actually increasing that funding to 60%. Now, I don't know what that's going to do, how it's going to pass, how it's going to move forward, but all of those things influence what we can do and the opportunities that we can have to buy Chromebook, Chromebooks for our students, to um, offer some robotic training to uh, increase our technical education programs. We have a huge number of people here who are interested in technical education. So when I talk about 8.89%, I also know that in town, taxes have gone up more than in the rural communities. So I don't believe that I can just make a blank statement on how that affects an individual or an individual family. I, I know that if we can get some more funding, that that can only help us because we have decreased in funding in our state. Uh, we increased last year and prior to that, we have decreased over the last five years. And so that's been detrimental for us to be able to make some, have some of the opportunities that we need to have for our students and for, and for our staff and our teachers as well. I, I guess I don't have an opinion, a strong opinion about whether it's too high or too low. Um, I look at things more like, are we getting the value out of it? And and if I ask that question, I would say we can improve. Um, I, for the past couple of years, have advocated going back to the two thirds. Uh, funding out of general revenue as Tommy Thompson promised and we got away from when Mr. Doyle got into office. Uh, so that would change the, the dynamics quite a bit and it would give us more leeway when we're thinking about what do we want to do uh, in terms of making our schools even better. Do we want to do, I think, I think actually we have to do an operations, we have to look at operations first and, and then look at bricks and mortar. I think that was kind of, you know, we have to look at where we can invest more um, in the human resource side and, and then see what do we need to build to make that work. That's the way that I would approach it. And if we get to uh, a 60, I'm not sure if these numbers are real because this is 14, 15 numbers and it looks like, um, it, it looks like there's there's quite a bit of room if we got back to that two thirds level that we would have quite a bit more money that we could look how are we going to invest this? We could either just lower our tax rate, which would I think would be a good idea, but also we would have some room to say, now how are we gonna reinvest this extra money um, uh, it, it, and then prioritize it again. So I guess that's, I hope that's a complete answer, but obviously this is a conversation that um, as a member of the board, I would hope to have for uh, the entire time. I think this is probably the meat of the, the meat of the matter. Uh, um, I'll let you guys get ready for your closing statements. Just to let everybody know, I meant to mention this earlier, but um, a lot of you probably know Scott Mills did resign from the school board. So. Um, that means there is another position that's open, and I guess the way that's handled is that um, the school board itself decides who to replace him with. So they'll be taking applications, and uh, I talked to somebody at the school today, and they're going to let the new school board decide who that member will be. So uh, following the election, they're going to be taking applications to fill Scott's position 
uh, moving forward. So maybe we'll go in reverse order here for closing statements. Angie, you want to go first? Okay. Two minutes. All right. I'd like to thank all of you for coming, and once again, I'd like to thank Tim. I think that this is a huge undertaking, and I appreciate the effort and energy that went into arranging this. So thank you all for taking your time on the back issue plan to find out what that outcome was. Um, I would like to say that I work collaboratively with respect and professionalism with every person that I speak to. Through servant leadership, innovation, lobbying efforts, budget discussions and facilitating policy and procedures, I would like to think that I've contributed to the progress, growth, and development of the rural Area School District over the last 12 years. I legislate on the state and federal level in order to bring dollars to the district so that we can offer higher salaries and offer more educational opportunities for our students. I believe that equal opportunity for, the, um, for education is the answer to everything. And if we can be lifelong learners and we can teach the love of learning for our students, then they will have the most happy life possible because learning is everything. And if we can have the superpower of kindness in education, we've solved all the world's problems. So thank you for listening. I hope I helped your vote on April 2nd. Thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. Um, I have been on the board for nine years and I do love what I do. Um, I hope that someone is not running for the board for just one agenda item. We need to encompass everything in rural area schools. Um, we do have a good board, we work together, we respect each other and whoever does get on the board, I hope that continues and I believe it will. I don't think there's a bad candidate up here um, because we all have the best interest of the children and that's what it all comes down to. Um, I do promise you though that if I'm elected, I am not a person that's gonna be on Facebook causing drama. I'm not gonna cut down any other candidate to make myself look better. I wouldn't want that for our students and I certainly don't want that for the board. Um, we all have to live in this community together and we do all have the best interest of the kids and that's all it comes down to is a good education good staff and a good community. Um, so I, I promise you that I will always listen. I will have an open mind when I listen. I probably will tell you my side of things. Um, but I do want to be always a reasonable adult that will respect you and I will be responsible for my position in Viroqua schools and I hope that you will re-elect me to be on the Viroqua Area School Board. Thank you. Yeah, I thank you guys for coming out too, especially on such um, short notice and the other candidate, of course, for, for making time in their schedules. Um, yeah, I, I guess this isn't, a, this isn't a challenge that I necessarily contemplated even a year ago, and the referendum brought it to light to me. Um, it, so if you, if you want to think that that's a, a one agenda item, you, you can sure go ahead, but but I'm not a uh, I'm actually a person who I look at m many facets of of the entire problem, and um, that's the way that I would look at this job too. Is first of all to go in and learn, and um, spend some time really really talking with the current board members and talking with the community a as to how they want to see. Uh, that happen again. I'd like to reiterate. I think that we can have some some open forums about community um, issues without endangering open meeting laws. It's not difficult to do, um, and and I, I know that we can do that. And uh, I think that that's really important. I think the referendum and the way that it went down showed that there's a large uh, part of the community that feels like it's not being heard and it's not being included. And um, and I. I dread to think what will happen if we continue on that path. And personally, I think it's time for some, some new energy on the school board. I think that that will open it up and give other people an opportunity to come in and feel like, yeah, yeah, they do, there is a place for them too. And uh, so I, I hope that I can bring that, uh, that kind of energy to the school board. And um, yeah, I promise I'll work real hard. Thank you, thank you candidates. Thanks everybody for coming on Friday night. And uh, thanks to my helpers for helping me set up here tonight. Um, 
Uh, we will post the video. I'm not sure. I think we may have a problem with our connection. So it'll be on the Vernon Reporter Facebook page, Vernon Reporter YouTube channel. So if somebody didn't get a chance to come here, see it tonight, we'll be posting the video on there so you can refer them to that location. Thanks again for everybody for coming out.